So today we have Sabor Siddiqui. He's a financial crime compliance specialist advisor with a distinctive experience of working for and with the FIU, as well as the reporting entities and financial institutions. Um, he's a subject matter um, expert of suspicious reports, um, anti-money laundry, uh, CFD compliance reports, audits and investigations. So I will pass on to Sabor. He's a better person, better uh, suited to actually talk about himself and his experience. And this is exactly why we're all here. So Sabor, please, it's all you now. Well, uh, thank you very much again, Soraya. So I'll just, you know, go over my introduction once again. My name is Sabur Siddiqui. Um, currently, I'm with an advisory role for an uh, international consultancy firm, where my remit is to advise governments and law enforcement across the world on how to bolster the AML CFT regime, which just not just protects the ecosystem of the country when it comes to financial crime, but also the reputation. Uh, a big chunk of my experience is from the Financial Intelligence Unit, where I was primarily responsible for investigating STRs and SARS, and also um, proactively doing investigations with, with in conjunction with the law enforcement and the state security agencies. Based on intelligence, which comes in inherently by, by the FIU's own regime, but also exchange with the counter uh, part FIUs and intelligence agencies across the world. So that gave me some exposure of how investigations work, primarily for financial crime and, of course, um, related um, predicate offenses. And I also got a chance during my tenure, especially with FIU, to work with different jurisdictions, uh, different kind of law enforcement agencies, uh, with different mindsets, different approaches, different techniques of investigation. And that's the reason I thought uh, I would be able to share a bit of my knowledge about what course of actions one must take um, and what's the kind of uh, approach which might be feasible while carrying out investigations, in particular for financial crime. So, um, as you might have seen with, with the title of the webinar itself, it says that web or on-site due diligence uh, to, to rule out any uh, doubt about it, uh, I would state that there's no fixed approach or there's no uh, nothing which is uh, at the surface better than the other. So one cannot precisely say that on site is more credible or more, um, let's say, accurate than web due diligence. There are different avenues. There are avenues where only web due diligence could be performed and there are avenues where only um, on-site due diligence. As an example, if you are if you're looking about cybercrime or intellectual property violations and um, internet-based crimes, of course you cannot do an on-site due diligence because the, all the evidence, all the activity has happened online. So that's where there's no question of on-site due diligence. On the other hand, when we speak about um, criminality where something physical is moving, such as counterfeit currency, where you need to actually cite um, the currency itself, or we're talking about smuggling of goods. That's where, of course, you, you can rely on some bit of uh, web intelligence when it comes to benchmarking, tracking, shipping, and the databases. But in actuality, to determine whether the crime happened, you need to uh, establish where there was some movement of people or goods um, and hence arrive at a conclusion of your investigation. So largely speaking, for any investigations, there are some prerequisites. And uh, I would say that primary being um, that anyone who carries out investigation um, in terms of a body, in terms of personnel, should be qualified, right? Because everything goes for a toss and, and there's a big jeopardy around the entire investigation if it's proven or if it's established that the person or the body which carried out the investigation was not qualified. So qualification is the number one merit. Second one, of course, being a bit of uh, ethics that any investigation should be conducted with an independent and unbiased uh, without any prejudice mindset. Uh, we all have been victims of it that since our childhood, since our Growing up years, we have been consuming some kind of media or have been uh, a victim of hearsay, 
where we get to formulate opinions about certain industries, certain geographies, certain uh, ethnicities, certain, certain countries. But when you carry out an investigation, it's good that you know some background in terms of typologies of what kind of particular crime, criminalities, uh, risks emanate from a certain geography or certain, uh, let's say, class of business. But to paint a kind of broad scale brush on all those subjects who belong to that business, that ethnicity, that country, and look from the lens of suspicion is not the most ethical thing. And now that we are living in a very diverse uh, cosmopolitan world, that should be keep, kept in mind. And uh, one needs to very carefully scope out the investigation. The investigation could be a spiral and one needs to go out and carry out an investigation while um, establishing that what's the scope? What are you here to unravel? What are you here to determine? Uh, in case the scope has to increase, it has to be done in step by step, but there needs to be merit and justification of any enhancement in the scope. And that needs to be uh, kind of well documented and approved by any uh, authority which has at the outset let you or allowed you to carry out this investigation. Um, and, and since we are all mostly from the financial uh, domain, you would be seeing that the, the typologies, right? With the double payments, dupl duplicate figures, there's structuring, there's uh, sequential invoices. I'm not here to talk to you about because you know you guys are subject matter experts. So we are broadly because we are confined with time. We have half an hour, so we'd be going with uh, the approach in turn. I, I will not be going over typologies. Uh, the next uh, kind of key element in the approach of investigations, I would say, is determining the reason as to why you have to go over that investigations, right? Is it to identify a financial crime and then to uh, first identify and then to stop it, right? A financial crime, it might be fraud, it might be corruption, it might be anything. And then for your respective institution, if you are a government organization, for your country, if you are an institution, for your institution, you need to figure out that what is the exposure of risk which I am uh, there to mitigate by carrying out this investigation or the exposure which the criminality, which is under investigation, the prospective criminality must have caused. So determine the exposure, uh, exposure. Then another reason or rationale of doing that investigation could be to, to facilitate the recovery of whatever losses. They could be reputational losses, they could be loss of data, sensitive data, they could be financial loss, there could be a loss of intellectual property. So all of that recovery being the focus point uh, could be one of the rationale of carrying out that investigation. And then not just stopping or having stopped the current loss, but also seeing that this kind of criminality or misdemeanor does not happen again. So ensuring that this kind of uh, loss does not occur for the organization or for the country or for whatever regime you're working in the future. And while doing that, you must also see that the results of your investigation feed into the people who make the policies and the procedures and basically plug into what are the internal controls which the organization must have to ensure, at least I won't say that there's zero possibilities, but to curtail any future possibilities of such kind of criminality to happen again. And the need of the investigation itself could be emanating out of general legal requirements or the law practice, uh, but also they could be very precise statutes, they could be regulations, they can be contracts for your organization between the government and between any stakeholders of whom you work in the ecosystem with, and hence you might have to carry out that investigation. But please make sure that whenever you start an investigation, web or in person, you are well within the law, uh, well within the jurisdiction of uh, what remits uh, you have to follow. As an example, I personally have worked for the FIU and you would know that financial intelligence units of all countries could be of different formats. 
many of them are administrative many of them are law enforcement based many of them are juridical some of them are hybrid so administrative fios particularly mean that these fios do not have the right actually to go and arrest people go and pick them up and uh, um, kind of uh, interview them or interrogate them so here you have to see that in your organization in the law and the regulation in which your organization operates and within that organization whatever your remit is you will have to follow that uh, but some of the facts i would tell you that most of the investigations and i'm not talking about just the successful ones uh, most of them i would say 95% of the investigations start by tips right so if i were to give you some more statistics on that uh, less than 3% of statistics uh, less than 3% of investigations emanate out of internal audit reports or external audit reports or by by conventional reporting standards uh, most of the investigations are led by tips that could be internal whistle blowing external and for the tips which you get which are the starting point of investigations first you have to establish whether uh, the the tip is credible and what could be the uh, rationale of the person who is giving you tip but in good confidence because as you would believe that there could be one data vindictiveness and so on and so forth while someone tipping off against someone but you must uh, assimilate that there could be some intelligible piece of information over there which can unravel the larger things so at surface value you have to at least give it a glance right and then based on at times if you are well within the investigation you you could actually get a tip that your own boss is conducting corruption or there is a malpractice over there it's a decision making point whether do you want to kind of push some panic buttons or um there are also deliberations where this investigations has to be done internally or externally externally in the sense that if the internal audit and the governance team of the organization itself are hand in glove um, in that criminality or the suspicion then it's only obvious that the external agency takes over uh, the investigation or an external party external source they are a plethora of companies which carry out professional investigations um and in terms of investigations themselves very largely i would balkanize them into four or five steps the first one being of course obtaining evidence now here comes the part of web or on site right so they're different as i said the reason i i put a layer on what the organization's regulations are what the prevalent laws and legalities are um there could be instances where let's say a credit card company who has a suspicion about someone using the cards do not really have the remit of doing an on-site due diligence whereas there are there could be some banks who have corporate clients who do let's say trade finance where there is a remit of going and doing a on-site due diligence of their warehouse or factory or whatever so uh, it has to be based on what are the relationships between the organization and your client or whomever you are suspecting and whether you are well within your remit to conduct that investigation and the way you are informed uh, you are supposed to obtaining the evidence is key but it's only meaningful as long as those evidences are credible now um you you know that there's open source and then there's web searches and um even on site due diligences can be not not so credible i know of instances where uh, we have to give you know they say in english that give the devil its due that the people some of the professional money launderers and professional criminals are smarter then the law enforcement and intelligence agencies so they would put a front that will be very hard for you to unravel so uh, and by the way for most of us professionals had it been that they have they would be very naive and no send and just being uh, uh, you know carrying out that criminality we would have been out of our professions the reason we have to keep 
um, you know, us updated and be on the edges because the way and form of criminality, especially when it comes to financial crime, is evolving at a very fast pace. You all know with the advent of um, cryptocurrencies, uh, open um, decentralized blockchains, and um, digital money, it's 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 getting even more complex. Nevertheless, obtaining the evidence, the best possible form, whatever your organization can stretch out to. If your role uh, leads you to using the right tools and technologies, diagramming methods, open source intelligence, use that. And while understanding that, let's say if you are from banks, if you are from MSBs, you are not a detective, you're not a law enforcement agency. So the idea while reporting the suspicion is that you do your investigation to the best of your knowledge, to the best of your capabilities, while being well within the regulation. No FIU or law enforcement or police really expects a bank or a financial institution to go out and you know be incognito and do all that. So in that, in good faith, if your effort has been towards, for example, using the web-based tools, you, you all use um, things like, you know, uh, world checks and Lexus Nexus and uh, the Dow Jones of the world. Have that documented. What is the most pertinent thing um, in terms of if you are with a bank, if you need to do on-site due diligence, make sure that your intelligence teams or the RMs also know that what's at stake. Um, they must very well understand of what can lead to tipping off and what can't. Uh, hence, the way they ask the questions, the way they gather enhanced due diligence is very key. Um, of course, during during the tenure of business, what RMs have with your clients, they at times you know develop some affinity. Ensure that the RMs are well informed that that affinity or personal rapport between the RM and the client does not really cause um, tipping off. So obtaining evidence in the best way, uh, which is pertinent to that investigation, then performing analysis. Now, performing analysis, a very subjective term. Uh, performing analysis, again, I said that evidence is gathered. Now, different pieces of those evidences combine to a larger picture. So. Let's say you inquired about a person from his social media profiles, his company websites, uh, you did a sanctions check, you ran, ran an open source check. Uh, if you are doing, you know, if you're hiring a professional company, uh, just to see that whether it's making sense for that person to be having a certain kind of lifestyle, so on and so forth. So all that information is um, compiled and a holistic view is taken and then you perform an analysis while performing an analysis again i would stress on not being uh, driven by your own kind of prejudices uh, but seeing what's empirical what's something that could be established after you have conducted your analysis or investigation the next point is reporting now, based on the nature of your roles, based on the nature of your organization, uh, you must have due, uh, I would say, statutes of reporting. At times, there are jurisdictions and uh, situations of law which give you a timeline that from the first point of suspicion to the point of reporting, there should not be more than 35 days or 25 days. Particularly, let's say in UAE, uh, the for the banks, if they are raising an SAR or a STR on a person or a client, it should be within 35 days. That's the new statute. So make sure that to the best of your knowledge, to the best of your capability, the intelligence you're providing is having two basic elements. One, the information is given to the reporting stakeholder in a timely manner and in an accurate manner. So these two things go hand in hand. If you are timely, but you're not accurate, it goes for a toss. And if you are very accurate, but it's extremely lagged and the reporting is done at a very delayed manner, then the criminality has already happened. Maybe the loss is too late to be reversed. So timeliness and accuracy are two important uh, things as much as you want to be scrupulous on your um, investigation please make sure that 
it's well within the statutes of timeliness and accuracy and to the best of the knowledge and capability and then whatever you report be sure that this report might end up at the desk of the regulator the judicial authorities the arbitrations the trials um and hence you must be able to substantiate at any point of time in the future what you are reporting you might not say that i was driven by that thought i was carried away by this whatever you are writing you should be able to maintain that version at any point of time because i have seen that um, being very excited and impulsive on doing the investigations the reports do something else and why going to the court of law they they track back on what their findings are and then they said and that's where the reporting authorities or the reporting bodies can be liable they could be charged with uh, maligning the reputation or um, uh, defamation so evidence of course um, and while collecting that it should be well documented it could be in the form of documents statements whatever but make sure that they are taken or obtained lawfully and they are well documented um and there's due legal advice which you have around that analysis like i said should be independent it should be objective evidence needs to be substantiated and it needs to be uh viable with the entire apparatus of investigations uh, it could not be flying around in pieces here and there um and the results of the report of your reporting should be clear uh you will always not get the chance to be present in terms of uh, yourself let's say while in uae we were investigating something but there was a cross country investigations the actual judiciary was sitting in the united states now it's not always necessary that the person who worked on the investigation over here and compiled the report will be present in the court of law in the united states to be substantiating that so be sure that at times it might backfire and the reputation of your country your organization is at stake now uh, coming a bit to the web based and the on site on the web based <clears throat> there are tremendous uh, it's basically an ocean of information now in an ocean some water is not potable some water is not uh, you know uh, so pure similarly some evidence you get from let's say crawl backs or archived websites um can be rough uh, cannot be really used as an intelligence source for investigation but there are ways such as seeing the traffic on the website seeing the kind of usage on the website uh, seeing the trends on the website of how it has been used how old is the website uh, of the investigation how are the social media profiles of the people connected to that um, these are some good web based tools and there are some credible ones they give you definitely an added capability but for the instances where there has to be an on site investigations i would certainly say that any merit of any procedure let alone be investigations or anything so systems and technologies are secondary but primarily is the human capital so the right amount of training so i do not know you might be coming from different businesses but let's say to benchmark i'll give you an example of banks let's say a bank xyz has been suspecting some of its client of doing trade based money laundering now the idea would be um the art of asking questions is also something which one has to uh, master over the time so the relationship manager or the front end are not compliance people but they need to be very well abreast of what compliance stakes are at there so the way the questionnaires are built the way the emails are written the way the person goes and uh, communicates with the clients in the uh, pursuit of getting uh, more enhanced information should be uh, very well trained very well crafted and then this information should be circled back to the compliance and the investigations team in a very meaningful manner so let's say th- there could be a story telling by the client to the relationship manager but when it comes to the from the relationship manager to the compliance it should not be in the form of 
uh, a story. Reason being, let's say at the headquarters of any bank's compliance team, I have, let's say, 1,000 suspicious uh, transactions, suspicious activity reports. There are no um, capacities in general, I would say, to hear stories and to be reading stories. There needs to be a breakdown of data in a very intelligible manner. And what data would be input by the, in, uh, by the, by the team who has gathered the information? This will be consumed by those systems. So I might have the most, let's say, sophisticated and high tech uh, systems with AI and machine learning, the buzzwords. Uh, but not all of that goes for a toss and uh, does not get really meaningful if uh, the information fed into those systems are not really the most accurate ones. So. There needs to be the right SOPs, the right policies, procedures uh, in breaking that information, which is fed into from the investigations to the people who make the decisions and the decisions you make today. You might feel that, you know, the investigations which is happening, which might be actually helping me to curtail or mitigate the risk right now. But the idea of any compliance investigation regime is not just um, mitigate the current risk, but also to make something like a risk radar that here are the top typologies, here are the risks, here are the criminalities which I am susceptible to, which I am vulnerable to. And hence, that information or these systems which we are talking about help you formulate your risk radars, your strategies so that when such customers, when such risks, when such criminalities happen in future, you are better equipped, you are better prepared, you have good precedents of how to deal with these situations. And hence, it becomes more, more efficient for the investigators and as well as for, for the back ends of whoever is managing the investigations from the back. And also, here is a classic thing of which is, which is like a watershed which is going on, where we are talking about the PPP, Public-Private Partnership. Institutions, private entities by themselves doing the best investigations but not getting the right feedback and cooperation from the government apparatus does not really solve the purpose. Similarly, the law enforcement and the intelligence agencies could be doing a really good job but not getting the right cooperation and inputs from the industry, from the private players, again, is job half done. So, uh, rightly so, a lot of focus has been played on PPP, public-private partnership, and what investigations do happen, what investigations are carried out by different kinds of institutions needs to be shared uh, with the public private uh, with the public bodies for them to you know factor that in in things such as the national risk assessment, in the typology reports, in the annual reports. And similarly, what the so what what law enforcement is seeing or what intelligence agencies are seeing, they need to make their subject reporting entities be aware of what's going on in the market, what's going on in terms of the financial crime arena, and hence helping institutions to be better prepared. And lastly, um, it also goes down to the judiciary, right? At times, for example, in, in, in Middle East, there are countries where whistleblowing was not a very usual practice. Now we are seeing that a lot of focus is going to whistleblowing where it's being fostered and encouraged to whistleblow, um, while also giving the right amount of immunity to the whistleblower, um, the right amount of coverage, anonymity. Um, and what needs to be done is the legal systems, the laws, need to accommodate for these new things and also based on the law in conjunction with the law uh, your organization's own internal uh, practices procedures policies need to ensure that any investigation any reporting uh, inherent or extrinsic or external should be well covered well within the remit and should not be just there to you know, tick the checkbox that I have reported, I have investigated, but also to safeguard not just your institutions, the industry, and in general, the jurisdiction in which you operate. 
So I, I think I'm, I'm a bit overstretched in terms of time, but I would like to open the floor to any questions which Surya might have got in chat. And yeah, thank you, thank you for that. Um, so we do have one question already. Uh, with regards to the wire card case, what mm -hmm. could be the due diligence or compliance lessons we could learn? And that's a very good question and a very relevant one. Um, what I feel personally, and based on what's out in the public, of course, I would not delve into what information I might have been privy to by virtue of my tenure at the FIU, is people at Wirecard were being, you know, let's say they, they knew what they were doing. And it was not just, you know, off the, um, it was not impulsive. So while, um, while having the internal audits, while having the, um, I would say, governance regime acting, this thing was, it, they were hand in glove and it was not shared with the regulator, with the law enforcement at the right point of time. Later it was for certain and there are people who showed the courage and did testify. But in general, it was not a procedure failure. They had the right procedures. Uh, they had the SOPs well documented. The external auditor had vouched for it, uh, but there was governance failure over there. So like I said, uh, everything happens in conjunction. You might have the best SOPs, the best systems, but poor ethical and governance standards, you have things such as this happening. Brilliant. Um, is there any questions? So, as you know, we now open our Q and A session. So, feel free to ask any question. We have another I one. I pick a question from the chat. How often do we need to conduct a due diligence uh, check for our vendors? Now, very good question by whom so I asked. Definitely, it should be proportionate to the risks that kind of vendor brings. I know there are practices such as annual questionnaires exchanged and most of you would know that how much of a thick checkbox approach it is. Um, at times vendors, they come from their own uh, agendas. I'll give you an example. While the Russian problem is unfolding of uh, Russians being sanctioned and Russia being sanctioned, there were certain providers of um, intelligence which were based out of Russia. And can you only imagine that what kind of um, fair due diligence will they provide about Russian oligarchs and Russian peps when it comes to um, screening? So you must also, for example, if I were a bank using that kind of a tool, as soon as this problem started, even if I would have conducted the due diligence in January 2022 where the entire conflict did not start, I would have immediately after the geopolitical developments would have due, done a due diligence about it. Uh, due diligence just does, does not mean that checking or uh, running, you know, due diligence on the directors and the stakeholders and the beneficial owners, but also seeing that the kind of data, the kind of quality they're providing, is it commensurate to what they were signed up for? So in this particular classic example, the reason I'm uh, alluding is that there was a conflict of interest and hence I know a lot of um, financial institutions stopped using that tool because they were, uh, you know, by design not serving the right interest. Perfect. Um, we have two new questions, one from Mohammed. Uh, what comes under what comes under the umbrella of financial due diligence and who is it necessary for? Well, <clears throat> uh, Omar, um, so I uh, you know, it sounds cliche, but for anything, uh, for financial due diligence, of course, is not just financial crime, but the financial health and uh, capacity of a person, entity, or the organization as well. Um, so financial due diligence is a very comprehensive term. It comes to um, how commensurate the financial landscape or the health of the organization or the individual looks with regards to what should be expected. So let's say, uh, for a company which sign ups during um, 
let's say in January 2022, and it tells that the envisaged turnover is 5 million uh, per year. And within four months, you find that they've already moved money to the tunes of 6 million, 8 million in four months, then definitely that needs to raise an alarm. So the answer to this is a risk-based approach based on the products, based on the channels, based on the business, based on the types of uh, um, risks you're subjected to, you need to have a comprehensive risk-based approach and where you need to um, write down the right procedures of how would you conduct uh, due diligence for a certain category of customers, certain category of businesses, certain channels, certain partners, so on and so forth. And it is necessary in the right proportion for everybody. So there are no saints and angels, right? Uh, even for the dignified, you know, well-known peps, there needs to be a proportionate level of due diligence happening, I would say, perpetually. Brilliant. I hope that answered the question. We have another question from, and I do apologize if I'm murdering your name, how much of a whistleblowing process works in favor of an organization? Personally, it's more vindictive in nature, you say. Well, definitely. Uh, so, depends. There is anonymity in a lot of jurisdictions which comes with the uh, whistleblower, but at times when the whistleblower is asked to submit evidence, he would have to reveal his identity, uh, at least not to the uh, defendant, but to the court of law in confidence. But out of the instances I have seen uh, personally, we have in the region, since whistleblowing is new, uh, we have made some significant pro uh, progress and there could be definitely motives behind whistleblowing and there could be one data and vindictiveness. Uh, but largely, uh, like whistleblowing, if it's within the organization and within, uh, you would know that, you know, a person who was fired and the person who went while being upset from an organization, he would then whine about his ex-colleagues and uh, put reports. We have seen examples of that too. Uh, but majority, um, any piece of information, even while the motive is vindictiveness, that might be a stepping stone for an investigations, right? Um, but for me, there are positives and negatives, but the positives outnumber the negatives. Brilliant. Um, so another question, can you share in brief the current laws and legislation around the world that are mandating businesses to conduct due diligence? Well, I don't know which country this person who's asking this question, but assuming he's from the Middle East or the UAE, um, I would say that not just UAE, but any other country. So you should not be mandated by law. It's not because of a law or a regulation that you need to report uh, any kind of criminality. It's a basic ethical um, moral responsibility. Just think of it that, that way. Um, so, for example, in UAE, um, back in until 2018-19, once the FAT of mutual evaluation did not start. So we had a certain confined number of uh, reporting entities. But when came the mandate that anyone who's established and have, has an MOE license and uh, all the DNFBPs in particular, the jewelers, the car dealers, the art dealers, they need, uh, the real estate providers, they need to report. So, of course, that led to a push, but even since, uh, in an absence of this regulation, uh, everyone was supposed to report. And uh, most of the authorities, for example, in, in UAE, you would know that there's self-policing and Dubai police and Abu Dhabi police and uh, the, even the FIU encourages people that if they are convinced that there's a criminality happening, irrespective of the mandate, they should be uh, reporting. So to answer your question, um, the current laws and regulations, of course, um, whistleblowing has come in, but it does not require a law or a regulation for you to report. It's a... Uh, some ethical and moral responsibility for institutions and personnel to report uh, to safeguard their own organization if that is a victim but it's also a duty in terms of being member of a community brilliant um actually what about the eu mandate well eu mandate is something that not i specialize with so i would uh, rather not delve into it 
um, but what I know at the surface of it is um, you would be surprised that, you know, uh, despite being the one of the most advanced and mature, mm. Just the mm. EU is still trailing behind when it comes to having the right and proportionate yeah. uh, laws around that. Um, and there's so much, there's abundant gray area over there. Um, and the way the law and the regulations have been uh, written is there are a lot of murky waters over there where that can actually come into play and be in the interest of the criminals. So what, what I see is that definitely they have something which was not there, but whether it is um, causing the right uh, results to come in, um, I doubt. Got you. Perfect. Okay. Um, is there any other questions? Um, this is the time. If you have any, any questions, please feel free to shoot it over um, the chat room. At the moment, we have 32 people watching this webinar. Um, it doesn't have to necessarily be questions. If you have any sort of experience that you want to share to have perhaps an opposing feedback or, you know, an opinion, uh, please feel free. I think that's perhaps all of the questions. Just give it another minute. Um, okay, so I think if there's no other questions, then we will end this session today. Thank you so much, um, Sabur. That was a great webinar. Oh, there's another question. Um, with regards to merchants and acquisitions, um, due diligence, what are the big risks to the transaction that um, that I cannot get wrong? Well, there are a lot of things where uh, you know, one can get wrong, I would rather say that. Uh, merchants and acquisitions being, because both the amalgamating parties bring their own baggage of uh, risks and uh, history. So the idea is uh, at times mergers or acquisitions can be done to cover up. So let's say a lot of times I have seen in my career that uh, a company which was named or accused or at least the name came about in some investigations to change their identity very quickly. Uh, they would get acquired by a shell company or vice versa in order to change their identity itself. Now, the new company, of course, brand new, uh, like a, you know, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of in its virgin state, uh, no problems at all. Uh, and if I were to do due diligence as a bank or a financial institution on the new company, definitely I will not find. So. It's only mature for me to ask about the composition of the company for the last five years, at least, for me to unravel that what kind of baggage is there, what is where is the original capital coming from, and so on and so forth. So um, the idea is not just to see the transactions for the last three months, four months, five months, whatever your SOP says, but if the company is newly formed and if you see that uh, the parent company has other companies within, um, and that could be in complex jurisdictions such as BVI and Panama and so forth. Um, I would ask for at least last four to five years of uh, transaction and the change in the company constitutions, board of directors, um, form of company, so on and so forth. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Ending this Q and A session at the moment. Um, since if if anyone in this chat does have any other questions, um, we will happy to share um Sibir's LinkedIn profile on the email, and perhaps reach out to him um directly. Or if you wish, please feel free to send your questions to us um directly, and we will divert those questions to our speaker. Um, I thank you all of you again uh, for showing up to this webinar and I do hope that you enjoyed the journey and I thank you our speaker today 
um what a great experience and um and i hope you have a lovely day thank My you all pleasure. thank you everybody bye bye